Good evening. Um, welcome to the concluding uh, lecture evening in our lecture series on EU energy policy on the road to decarbonization. <coughs> I always have to say at the beginning that um, this lecture series is co-organized with Climate Strategies, WWF and the Ecologic Institute and that we gratefully acknowledge the financial support of uh, the European Commission's Jean Monnet program, uh, the lifelong learning program. Um, tonight's concluding lecture, um, <clears throat> as, as the past lectures also, will look a little bit at the external relations, energy relations of the EU in the light of decarbonization. Um, the title is EU Decarbonization to 2050, Views from the Neighbourhood. And there are two countries uh, represented here that will bring views from the neighborhood, um, which are <clears throat> kind of similar but also very different. One is in the north. Uh, it's, it's Norway. Uh, Norway being obviously one of the major sources actually of fossil fuel imports into the EU at the moment, um, but also being discussed as a kind of a green battery for Europe, uh, green battery uh, as, a, as a potential, obviously it's not there yet. I assume we'll hear about that. Uh, a country also that um, repeatedly has not joined the European Union. Um, so we may assume that it will also uh, remain that way for some years to come. Uh, and then the second country is more towards the south, Turkey, a country that has attempted for some years now to um, get its accession talks going more deeply, um, a country that is mainly a, a transit country as far as I see it when it comes to, to energy, and I assume we'll hear about that, that role more um, and uh, yeah so a country that has been eager to join the EU but is still not there so still part of the neighborhood for the time being for the time being yes uh, we don't want to prejudge any future developments obviously uh, not at all um, so and and it's my pleasure to present to you two distinguished speakers from these countries and the first one is Leif Lunde and he's the director of the Treaty of Nansen Institute uh, in, in Oslo, or at least close to Oslo, Lysaka, uh, in Norway. Um, and he will be followed by Fatih, I um, don't know how to pronounce yes, it, correct. Fatih, Fatih uh, Hasdemir, um, Deputy Under State Secretary uh, at the Ministry for EU Affairs of Turkey. Uh, so a very warm welcome to both of you. And uh, I would then immediately, ah, yeah, I was supposed to mention at the beginning so that you don't uh, leave the room too early that after this lecture, there will be a reception outside this room. Uh, so you're, you're cordially invi invited for that uh, reception, having a glass and a bite uh, after this uh, lecture evening. Um, with that, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Leif Lunde. Please, um, you are eager to hear your presentation. Yeah. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I'm very glad to, to be here. Uh, I'm very impressed with the, with the way that, uh, with the very substantive and, and uh, visionary way that you are addressing the issue of energy and climate change in the, in the seminar series that you had. So I've been able to, to look at your website and to look at many of the other uh, man, many of the other meetings that you had, uh, which is a, a very useful resource uh, for us, uh, who are doing research in um, in in this uh, in this area. Uh, I'm I'm Leif Lunde, as uh, as uh, has been said. I'm the director of the of the Fritjof Nansen Institute. I'm coming back to that just in a in a second. A few words about about where where we and where I'm I'm coming from. Uh, there is this when we are addressing this issue of, of decarbonization and the major the major challenges of of, uh, of decarbonizing um, uh, energy and, and, and reaching climate goals. Uh, there is this uh, Norwegian ambivalence to this topic. We are uh, in some some sense we are we are thinking the big uh, the big thoughts and and, uh, and talking about engineering the politics of Europe's energy transformation. What will it take? And that's really. Uh, in one way, the topic, uh, my topic today, but but it's it's all it's also uh, also I think uh, 
fair to reflect uh, on the, the point, uh, the fact that, that Norway in many regards is a very small country, so in, in another sense it's just a few humble thoughts on Europe's daunting energy challenges from a small country outside the European Union. And, and I used to say when I come to Brussels that I'm here to apply for a personal membership <laughs> in the Union because uh, uh, the, 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 the Norwegian population is a bit difficult to, to move in, in the direction that I would have liked it to, to move. But uh, just a few words about where I'm coming from, so not that, uh, about, about the, 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 the institute that I'm heading. Uh, I, came, I, 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 I worked with that institute a very long time ago, right from university until 1995, but then I've been doing a lot of other things. Uh, my last job in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs was the Energy and Climate Change Advisor to the Foreign Minister, uh, and I've been doing uh, a lot, uh, uh, also uh, other, other business in, in, the, in the Norwegian, Norwegian <coughs> Ministry of Foreign Affairs. But the, I came at, as a new director in February this year. Uh, the institute is an independent social science and international law research institute based in Oslo. Uh, the key topic that is running through almost everything that we do is effective and responsible management of natural resources. And the key focus is on the international level. But still, as you know, uh, we know uh, a lot about uh, addressing uh, challenges on the international level. Uh, there is a very intimate link to, to domestic politics. And that makes it very re relevant for us in Norway, since Norway, is, as I will come back to, is in many ways a really a natural resource country. Uh, with Canada, with Australia, there, uh, we, we are we are <coughs> we are really a, 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 a country that is dominated by by having very rich natural resources. Such resources can be a blessing; it can also be a curse, as as you know from from uh, from the world of, of, of energy and geopolitics. Just you see the main uh, the main research areas of which European energy and climate change policies is a key topic. We are coming out with two books now on on, uh, on emissions trading and and the EU and and the role of industry and so on. Uh, one book now in December and one book in May next year. So so it's just I'm, I'm not I'm going to touch on these issues uh, later on, but but it's it's not my, my main topic here today. Uh, management of Arctic natural resources. Uh, a hot, a hot issue these days and, and a very important for us. Russian uh, and Chinese energy and environmental policies, biodiversity and genetic resources, ocean and fish, fisheries management, and, and then again the overarching issue of, of effectiveness of international environmental uh, cooperation. So this is, uh, we are 30 researchers, 40 people at the institute, uh, so a mid-sized uh, mid institute, but, but it's, a, it's a privilege to, to, uh, to be able to work on such such uh, topical issues globally and also highly relevant to, to, to our own country. Uh, Norway is outside the Union, Sweden, Denmark and Finland are in the Union, Iceland may be joining uh, the, the Union. So in, in, in approaching energy issues and, and re the relevance of Norway, uh, I, I choose to start by just a few thoughts on the on the relevance of the Nordic approach, because it's, it's, it's uh, in, in it, it's, even though Norway is very special in, special in many regards, um, uh, I think the Nordic countries, uh, when we are talking about how to dramatically transform Europe's energy model towards a decarbonized uh, model, uh, <coughs> I think there are, there are uh, unique contributions from all the Nordic uh, countries, with Sweden, with both biomass and, and a very solid uh, sort of effort to, to to, to, uh, to go for renewable energy. Uh, Finland with biomass also handling energy security issues with, with Russia uh, in, in a very delicate and, and, and impressive way. Uh, Denmark uh, very much go, uh, investing in wind power and other renewables. Iceland with geothermal power and even plans to, 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 to build cables from, from Iceland to, 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 to both to Norway and to the, to, the, to the UK, even though that is I think a bit, uh, a bit into the future. But still, <coughs> and then integration of electricity markets uh, was very early in the Nordic area, and and, and I think it's been a, uh, uh, it's been an ins ins uh, inspiration both in Europe, but also we see in 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 in, um, in, in both in, in Latin America and in Africa and Asia, we see we see people who come to learn from how, how not the Nordic countries have worked to to liberalize and integrate energy markets. We have trust-based political systems, uh, uh, which is, uh, I think, a good starting point for radical energy change. Uh, we'll come back to, to, the, to the significance of this later on. 
we have we have uh, in different ways also been able to formulate and implement quite ambitious energy strategies in in different areas. But then again, <coughs> this positive heritage and and the current relative economic success of our countries also demands much of Nordic energy strategies. And then the question is whether we are up to the challenge. Uh, I'll just go through a few figures about and, and uh, to give you a, a sense of, of Norway as an energy nation. We are, we are a very small country, uh, 5 million people, so, so in most regards we are very small. But, uh, but energy is one of the issues, one, one of the areas where we matter globally. And, and, and <coughs> you can see that from the fact that we are the sec world's second largest gas exporter. I, I think there were some graphs in one of the previous presentations where you, you saw Russia first and then Norway quite close in terms of, of, uh, of, of gas exports to, to, to Europe and, and we are also still uh, a major uh, oil exporter. And, and we provide Germany, France and UK with, uh, with uh, almost as much as, the Rus as Russia does. We are a major player in the emerging Arctic energy adventure, for good or bad maybe, but, but still, still, I think in the global, just in starting off with this global perspective. And, and uh, while there was a downward, downward trend in, in the Norwegian continental shelf until 2010, uh, now there is a major new, uh, major new, new sort of rush and, and a lot of big new finds of both oil and gas, and many of them far north into the Norwegian part of the Arctic. So that is, uh, that is also a dilemma, which I come back to, but, but I think it's important to see that this is part of the dynamism that Norway, that, uh, and it's, it's, for instance, one of the aspects of the dilemma just to, uh, is that uh, it's extremely difficult to hire people also for the re renewable energy because, because the oil industry is, is soaking up everything. It's, it's drawing, it's, it's, really, it's really a dynamic uh, power right now because of this new optimism. Uh, but then we are also a key European player in hydropower. We have half of Europe's uh, hydro reservoir capacity, and Starcraft uh, is uh, probably depending on how you count, but, but uh, on some accounts are at least uh, Europe's largest renewable energy company. And it's a major, major power producer in, in Norway. Uh, we provide already a green battery function to Denmark and Netherlands, and uh, I'll come back to this, and, and then to, to um, I'll soon, we'll soon do that also to Germany and. Uh, and the UK, there are agreements now on the cable to, to Germany in, in 2018 and to the UK in 2020. But there's also a lot of resistance to this, and which is a, is a dilemma that I'll come back to. And then we have the world's uh, either largest or second largest sovereign wealth fund, currently uh, Euro 500 billion euro, which is deriving uh, exclusively from income from, from oil and gas. We also run the, the, the largest uh, oil for development program with, with we are providing advice to, to, to governments in the developing world uh, who have uh, oil and gas resources on how to manage these, these resources uh, responsibly, including in terms of, of, uh, of environment uh, and also in terms of climate change. In fact, even though, again, you see the dilemma here since we are talking about decarbonization, but, but one, of the, one, of the, one of the key environmental issues that we are taking up in advising uh, governments in the, in, the, in the developing world is uh, is how to how to get rid of gas flaring, which is a major source of, 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 of climate change emissions. And then we are also becoming a quite uh, a quite significant power in terms of global of funding schemes for renewables in, in across the across the developing world. So these are these are some of the main aspects that that uh, that that put Norway on the on the global energy map. Uh, we're a very small country, but a quite sizable player in terms of energy. And that's all, of course also why. We are relevant to the European Union. Uh, so, <coughs> well, this is just about. Uh, I'm going to provide you with also quite some critical perspectives on Norway. But so, uh, but just to start with uh, some of the some of the achievements. I don't know if you saw. There's a quite interesting report from uh, just produced by the Canadian International Council with a very critical perspective of Canada as a resource country. And uh, you can see that you can source it at the, at the and Google it at the Canadian International Council. And, and, um, but it, it uses Norway very much as a model for how we have organized, uh, or organized uh, the, the energy resources and the natural resources. Um, and then uh, just yesterday, I think, I don't know if you've seen that, uh, there was a publication of the, uh, the Global Energy Architecture Performance Index for 2013 uh, by the World Economic Forum and, and Accenture. 
Uh, it was uh, launched in Hanover because Norway came on the top of the index. But, but again, I, I don't have the time to go into details, and, and there's probably a lot of a lot of of, uh, of uh, issues with, with such an index. Uh, but interestingly, Norway scored almost at the top at some dimensions, but only as number 25 in environmental sustainability at that index. Again, reflecting the, the fossil fuel, the dominance of fossil fuels in the Norwegian economic model. Well, and, and then again, reflecting also some of the Nordic perspectives, I think if we are going to look sort of more sort of politically and, and conceptually on, 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 on our on what sort of what our experience, or what kind of elements of inspiration for, for the major task that Europe is going through. So it, it's um, and the relevance uh, of our, our, uh, of our uh, achievements, it's the, the ability to set, to set goals and most of the whole society behind comprehensive strategy for how to make petroleum a blessing and not a curse for Norway. Uh, that, that from the very beginning when we found oil in the, in the late 60s and early 70s, uh, the parliament and all the major stakeholders were extremely concerned about uh, making this, uh, um, avoiding the Dutch disease, uh, avoiding all the negative aspects of, 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 of that countries have, have, um, have experienced when, when going into, into um, when, when finding, finding such uh, huge resources. And then, and then, I think the, the also the way that we have nurtured uh, a comparative edges in some of the some of the key areas, in, in not least in, in energy, and also the way that the, our industry has successfully globalized. You know, we have a major global not only oil companies but uh, an oil oil uh, oil and gas in, uh, service industry uh, that that has been uh, uh, a conspicuous uh, success. And again, uh, all the time with this uh, with this dilemma. Aspect up since it's still we are still in the in the world of, of fossil fuels. Uh, the mission challenge, <coughs> Norway to 2012 to 2030 to 2050. Part of the problem or part of the solution? That's I'm going to keep that as an open question. And there are there are pros and cons, and there are different aspects. But I think it, it's important to I think one of the lessons and one of the things that I'm concerned about also when going out of government and going to into research, uh, leading a research institute. It's still important to see, to, to see how can you contribute and, and then important not to forget about who you are as a country and what is your resource base, what is your comparative edge. So it, it, there's a, there's a, it could be a rather simple solution to say that Norway should just forget about fossil fuels and then for concentrate all attention on renewable energy and see what we can do about that. But that, I think maybe, maybe in 20 years, maybe in 30 years, that, that's the world, but that's not the world today. And I, therefore, I, I listed a couple of, of, of bullets where I think there are important contributions that Norway has made and can continue to make in, in reducing the, the carbon footprint of fossil fuels. Uh, again, the, the first uh, bullet on, on, on gas sides to Europe and helping Europe uh, go, go away from coal and over the gas is a huge issue and I don't have time to go into all the controversies around that, but I still think it's, it's valid. It's also a reminder that how, 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 how uncertain things are, and, and, uh, and if, if you had uh, told people just two or three years back that, that Germany would now uh, increase CO2 emissions because they are importing a lot of coal from the US, uh, you, you people wouldn't believe you. But, but there's a, the, the, the shale gas revolution in the US has uh, made coal in the US very cheap, and then, uh, and then, uh, you, and then Europe is... Um, uh, and Germany in particular. I haven't seen the figures for other other European countries, but but it's a it's a it's a dilemma. And then it also under underlines the still the relevance of natural gas as a as a resource that that can contribute to reduce emissions still and can can do it. And and then Norway has a role. But again, <coughs> as I come back to CCS, it's it has to be decarbonized as as we go along. But then uh, we had a, we had the first CO2 uh, tax in Norway in 1991. And, and that has contributed quite significantly to, to reduce reduce CO2 emissions from all the different uh, all the different uh, uh, levels in the in all the different areas of, of, of and, and uh, the full range across the full range of the petroleum production cycle, and and that's uh, because it's not as you see from the discussion on oil sand in Canada, uh, the fossil fuel is not the fossil fuel and oil is not oil. And, and, and the, 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 the climate footprint of fossil fuels differ significantly. And, and, um, and, and there, I think, to continue to focus on how to, how to minimize CO2 emissions from fossil fuels is a very important area, but Norway has quite a lot to contribute. 
and then CCS has been a major major uh, investment and major engagement for Norway. Uh, we, I am interested interested to hear from you on CCS. I, I haven't seen such a bleak uh, picture for CCS in a long time. So so it, it's really a, I really see that as a challenge and and of course with for Norway as a to build a bridge between being a fossil fuel uh, producer, a major fossil fuel producer, and to be a responsible climate change uh, player, uh, CCS is, is extremely important to bridge that gap. And if CCS is now becoming well more and more difficult, at least in, in many in many ways, it's it's uh, it's really it's really really serious. But then other other aspects of decarbonisation is. Uh, the elimination of gas flaring. Uh, we have been working also with Russia to do that because that is a major, still a major problem in Russia, and it's probably also some of the one gas flaring is, is part of the picture also behind behind the black carbon phenomena that is is, uh, is making an impact not least in, in the Arctic. So this but this uh, but this is just to illustrate that there are quite uh, a number of areas where we can be relevant to decarbonisation. Paradoxically, paradoxically speaking, in in the area of fossil fuels. So let's keep that as in one dimension. And then the next main dimension is uh, is uh, is from petroleum partner to sustainable energy partner for Europe uh, a question mark. Uh, we are already a major <coughs> clean electricity provider to Northern Europe or to well major is, is probably probably maybe and uh, but but there, we have the the network in, in in the Nordic countries and then we are we have there are three cables to and four cables to Denmark and there's a cable to, to the Netherlands and um, and I think it's fair to say that Denmark couldn't have have made this uh, impressive transformation to and made wind power such an important part of their their grid and, and their, uh, their electricity production if they had not had, had Norwegian hydropower as a balancing power. That has been critical for, for, for Denmark uh, in order to, to, to maximize investments in, in, in wind and also to some extent solar. So that is uh, that is, is important, and and then there is the strategy to to provide green battery functions to Germany and the UK and, and Europe more broadly. It's a big it's a big discourse. It's difficult. There are there there are a lot of industry people who are against further export of, of green electricity from Norway because they fear higher prices. Like there are many Americans who are uh, against uh, the US exporting LNG because they are afraid of higher. Uh, gas prices in, in the US, so you have you have that that aspect as an important uh, barrier, and then there are a lot of, of uh, the, the issue of, of Norway as a green battery to Europe is, is splitting the uh, the environmental movement. There is one fraction, big important fraction of, of, of the of the environmental NGOs that are very much in favor of the green battery, uh, of, of further increased Norwegian export of of, of electricity to uh, green electricity to to Europe, uh, the, the, the NGOs focus mostly on climate change, but then there are, are, are other more sort of nature conservation oriented NGOs who are very much uh, skeptical of, of this because there are local environmental trade-offs involved. So and, and again, it's a it's a it's really it's a it's a big issue in, in Norway right now, and and, and, and it's <coughs> there's elections next year. It's it's a it's also an issue that is splitting political parties. So so, but I'm personally I'm quite. Uh, enthusiastic about about this issue. Uh, there is uh, and, and also the first the first uh, issue that is taken up and our prime minister is meeting with Merkel, meet, meeting with Cameron is how 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 how, uh, how is it going with the green battery? Because it's so to to have uh, to have a hydropower uh, as a balancing power for intermittent uh, wind and solar is is a hugely popular option for. For symbolically and and but also in sort of real terms, so so this is this is a major issue and there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, potential in Norway. We we cannot be a battery for all of Europe in in, in in any way, but 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 the main the main limitation is infrastructure. Is infrastructure on our side? Uh, the cables are quite uh, they are expensive, but they are profitable to build. But it's it's infrastructure in Norway. Uh, uh, that need to be strengthened, and the infrastructure in Germany and UK and and this and, and, and in, in Europe in, in, in general. Well, this is I, I spent just some time on green battery. We, we can go back to it in the, in, the, in the discussion. And then we, we we are implementing the renewables directive. We are very much integrated in the European Union, and, and as the three the three leaders of the European Union who came to Oslo to receive the peace prize in 
in uh, in on Monday they 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 many times came back to the issue that Norway is among the best in the class in in uh, they are integrating much more into the European Union than many of the European Union countries to the European Economic Area. But anyway, uh, offshore wind is a, is a possibility. There's a there's, uh, we have a lot of, of competence from the oil and gas sector that is relevant in 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 developing offshore wind, but but still still uh, a. Uh, uh, the, the one of the problem is that the, the coast of Norway is extremely deep, so so it's uh, it's much easier for for the UK and some of the other North Sea countries to to develop la large scale uh, wind power. But we have a lot of competence that is being used. And then uh, the, the, there's a big discussion coming up about, uh, about the oil fund, the 500 billion euro oil fund that uh, Europe needs investment for infrastructure for everything. And 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 there are uh, for instance there are. are uh, proposes that that the oil fund or the fund which obviously made made a switch through fossil fuels that it should be denied to invest in fossil fuels that we should sort of make up for the for the for the sins of the past by investing in renewable energy investing in renewable energy infrastructure so this is uh, this is a very interesting debate that is coming up and and, and uh, which is relevant and, and Norway is also cooperating with all the other sovereign wealth funds uh, globally uh, through a kind of IMF uh, sort of light coordination structure and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a topical issue, we can come back to that also. But there is need, I think, the, when we are moving from fossil fuels to, to renewable energy, the, we see the need for even closer energy cooperation between EU, EU, EU and Norway and just an example, one of, the, one, of the, one of the developments that really concern Norwegian players right now is the, some of the new, new ideas that are coming up for for levies on electricity tran transmission across countries, across boundaries, that is is a, is a proposal in the EU, EU system in order to to mobilize uh, financing for for infrastructure. It's a legitimate uh, way of raising money, but but still, uh, uh, Norwegian players fear that this may become may may make the whole the whole equation uh, non profitable. So then, <coughs> so I'm 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 going through some uh, slides quite fast to, towards the end here because. Uh, to, to again to to move to to um, to, to Europe and, and also some of the key challenges that uh, that uh, that I see for both for, for for Norway and Europe and and, and the world. Uh, but I think uh, the European Union's pioneering role in integrating energy and climate change has been a major inspiration for for Norway and for for many stakeholders in Norway. So it's it's um, the, the the efforts of some of the key European countries and the European Union to. To be a driving force for low, a low carbon future, the ETS in rough weather, but still hugely important as a, as the, the the mechanism that we have. Uh, it has moved climate concerns from PR offices in in industry to to boardrooms in key European industries, and I think that is that is really integrated uh, climate change into the, the the core issues of of, of both companies and, and governments. And, and Germany's energy vendor shows the way. It's it's, a, it's an impressively rapid turn to renewables. Uh, that that's really and, and with the sort of full support from the Europe, from the EU level. But then uh, a lot of challenges down the road. I don't know if you have discussed the, the new book by Dieter Helm on, on the carbon crunch. With with really quite some uh, some criticism of, of the performance of the European Union and he, he among other things he he he, he discusses why it, whether it's fair to to, to count emission reductions based on production rather than consumption. So I think one of his theses is that it's, it's really emissions in Europe hasn't gone down over the last 20 years. It has, if it has the main thing, it has gone up because it's we are in we are we are China is taking to China and Asia is producing uh, is producing all the goods that we are, many other goods that we are we are consuming and they get the they get the, the CO2 emissions and uh, and which really should be accounted here. In Europe, so but but anyway, I, I, it's a, it's a, at least it's a it's an issue for for, for discussion. And and then <coughs> it's a, maybe a bit gloomy, but I think when we are discussing the future now, the future for Europe, the future for Norway, and and how we how we together can can uh, can work to to, um, to and also set or set the course for a for for decarbonisation in the longer term, we need to. Also to, to to understand where we are and and not to be naive and and, and it's it's in many ways uh, I I'm, I will conclude on a more positive note but it's it I think it's uh, it's it's important to take into account uh, that 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 we are in a, in a quite serious situation right now with the global emissions increasing and coal making a return 
uh, this new oil and gas bonanza, also also a really a dilemma for, for Norway. Uh, can anything stop and limit the exploitation of new fossil fuel provinces or sources? The Arctic uh, discussion, there are, discu there are discussions here in, in Brussels about a possible moratorium in the Arctic, but is that, again, is that the way? Is there a, is there a political will to, to really to stop this at any point? Not doesn't seem very very likely, but I'm, I'm curious to hear about ideas. I think, as you probably know, the Norwegian general, if you ask the Norwegian prime minister, who's an economist and, and very much concerned about climate change, but also, of course, about Norwegian national interest, he is the standard answer for Norway is you have to you have to to tax consumption. You have to focus on consumption. You have to you have to to, to have policy mechanisms on the consumption level and not to target production. And that's, uh, but again, let's uh, let's uh, I'm, I'm, let's uh, let's discuss that. But that's uh, another there's uh, the, the few quality directive uh, discussions here. That is is uh, one of the mechanisms where you are also targeting production, for instance, of oil sand and so on. But then uh, man, many of the other issues that you can see on this foil are, are quite sort of obvious. But still, still it's a, it's a it's a tough uh, it's a it's a tough outlook right now that we need to, to keep in mind when we are, are developing our strategies for the future. And then, and then I think also this this fossil fuel dilemma is uh, that is very very acute for Norway, uh, but 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 also also uh, also um, uh, the the fact that that even 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 the even the resources that have been identified and that are sort of in the pipeline for being produced are always or already driving us far far beyond the the, the, the two degree uh, the, the, the two degree goal of, of reducing emissions. So. And, and there, there was, a, I think, <coughs> I think there was um, in Financial Times, so, uh, an example, just impressionistic example of how, how, how challenging it is to, to turn these super tankers uh, just by comparing two, two, two economic players at, at comparable levels, Apple and Exxon. And, and they are in, as you see in, in, um, in net income, they are comparable. But then uh, in, in, when you compare the property, plant and equipment of the two companies, you see to see the significant challenges in terms of in, in, in terms of what kind of uh, economic and political players these these uh, th that they are. So this is again again just uh, just an, uh, a reminder of of, uh, of, um, of how challenging this is. And then towards the end, uh, what will it take? Um, we need a, a, um, a sustainable crisis consciousness, and, and that is uh, that is a contradiction in terms in many ways. Uh, because the crisis is something that is coming and is going over, but 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 uh, but but that is on the climate, the, the classical dilemma with regard to climate change. You need to sustain the concern over time, and and that is for pol in the political world that's extremely challenging. Continue investing in credible science and science politics interfaces. It's a topic that we have worked with a lot in our institute, and I think it's still 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 uh, uncertainty about climate change. And, and efforts by many players to politicize and, and to, 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 to put forward doubts about, about whether climate change is real is still, I mean, in 2007, 2008, it seemed that everybody agreed. But now again, when, when, things, when, the, when the going gets tough, again, these questions come up, so it, it's, very, it's very important. And then fairness and effectiveness favors targeting carbon consumption and not production, question mark. But again, uh, it, it un underlines also what I'm saying to, towards the end of this file, uh, we have to, 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 to get uh, China and the other BRICS countries on board in, in, in a common understanding of what is a fair, fair burden sharing. But, and then uh, in more specific terms, uh, we need to get serious on coal to gas uh, transition, accelerate CCS, but that's again, uh, I'm curious also to hear your outlook on, on CCS. Uh, and then lines of contention. Um, uh, there is a paradigmatic change of speed needed in building cables and transmission lines. Uh, if you look, for instance, at even of Germany has fantastic uh, uh, in, in uh, achievement in, in renewable energy, but if you look at how many kilometers of transmission lines they have built over the last 10 years, it's almost nothing. Mm -hmm. so, so, so there is a, we need a revolution in infrastructure and in transmission lines in, in order to get the renewable uh, revolution uh, going. Uh, and then ETS, uh, you probably uh, know very much about the ETS and many of my colleagues are writing books about it, but again it is, there are some real dilemmas and, uh, and uh, not least in, in, in how to make it work in, in, in 
competition with other uh, subsidy schemes for renewables and so on and so forth. And then, uh, and then the, the, the challenge of, of not locking, locking in uh, uh, technologies that may not be the technologies of the future. Again, huge issues, but we need to take them with, with us. And, and then finally, in political terms, what will it take? And I think it's, uh, uh, it's important, uh, again, because climate change is going to be with us. It's a long-term challenge. We need, it's about people, consumers, voters. Uh, and we have to, to prioritize both vision and honesty and transparency and consultation at the same time. And we have to be honest about uncertainties, costs and trade-offs. There, no there is no free low carbon lunch. Again, I think in 2007, 2008, there was a lot of focus on almost on how, how the, that, that the, the uh, climate change revolution and the renewables revolution would be cost-free. I think that's, that's uh, again, uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dangerous proposition. I think we have, we have to work on attitudes, so we have to, 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 of course, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, attractive options that, that are maybe costly, but, but overall, I think it, it's a, it can be a dangerous proposition. And then the, the not in my backyard phenomenon in infrastructure or already touched on it. And I think I'm concluding on the significance of engaging China, the other BRICS, US and, and Russia. Uh, whatever we do, uh, Europe has been a, a very important model, a, a driving force, the European Union in, in climate change. But I think the Copenhagen, uh, the experience over the last years also shows limitations of a forerunner of what you can do. And, and, and also when we now see the global markets uh, are having kind of paradoxical uh, developments with coal being being produced or being consumed in a big way in, in Europe when we thought that coal was going out again. So so we need we need to, to keep the global perspective even though there's a lot that we can do in Europe. So I think that this is uh, this is all for today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, it was a very rich um, presentation, I, I thought at least, and very clearly displaying the dilemma in which Norway somehow is, uh, which is quite obvious from the fact that I think Norway has also committed to decarbonize its own economy and society yeah. by 2050, yes. uh, being one of the major uh, fossil fuel producers at the same time. So how that can that be brought together? Uh, we can discuss that later on, I hope. Um, but first, we'll change perspective, uh, and, and I assume pretty radically, um, from a small nor northern country to a much bigger southern country, with completely different economic conditions also, uh, etc. But we'll hear more about that uh, from Fatih Hastemir. Please, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And Thank you for giving us the opportunity to express our views on energy sector. As you say, I'm coming from a different country. At least, contrary to Norway, they don't want to get into EC. We still want to get into the EU. But the public opinion is and has been changing very drastically. When we started the negotiations in 2005, the public opinion in favor of EU was around 80%. Now it's about 50%, and it's going down. Despite the crisis, we still want to get into EU. Maybe we have some lessons to learn from Norway. <laughs> or the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> we have to wait and see. Anyway. Uh, I organized my talk in two parts tonight. The first part will be on Turkey-EU energy relations, and, and in the second part, I will concentrate on Turkey's perspective on EU decarbonization and how this will affect EU-Turkey energy relations. As you know, Turkey is a candidate country for EU membership. The negotiation process was initiated in 2005 for the energy chapter, the screening process was completed in 2006. However, screening report is still pending for approval in the Council and has not been given to the Turkish side. It's a, it has been about six years. Although no official information is communicated regarding the opening benchmarks for the energy chapter, no opening benchmarks are 
expected. Given the current state of the negotiations, where developments are not happening at the desired speed, it was necessary to initiate a new means to provide an impetus to the candidacy process. Thus, positive agenda was officially pronounced for the first time in the enlargement strategy paper 2011 and 2012. Commission stated in the document that a fresh agenda should be developed to start a new circle in the accession process and to enable more constructive and positive relationship between EU and Turkey. Positive agenda was officially started by a kickoff meeting uh, this year in May. Positive agenda is a working method which aims at enhancing Turkey-EU cooperation in areas of joint interest and fulfilling the technical opening and closing benchmarks of politically blocked chapters through working groups. Therefore, positive agenda will not bring an alternative to the accession negotiations, rather it will serve as a method to support and complement Turkey's accession process. The objective of the working groups is to work on the opening and closing benchmarks and to open and close as many chapters as possible within the shortest period of time, once the political blockages are removed, if they are removed at all. Positive Agenda has also the objective to enhance Turkey-EU cooperation in areas of joint interest such as visa, political reforms, energy, fight against terrorism, etc. In the energy sector, Positive Agenda, agenda Turkey-EU Enhanced Energy Cooperation document was adopted at a ministerial meeting in June this year. In this document, five topics of mutual interest were determined in which Turkey-EU energy relations could be deepened. And they are first, long-term long -term perspectives on energy scenarios and make energy mix. Second, market integration and development of infrastructures of common interest, that's gas, electricity and oil. Third, global and regional energy cooperation. Fourth, promotion of renewable energy, energy efficiency and clean energy technologies. And the last, point was nuclear safety and radiation protection. Turkey's legislative alignment with the energy aki is fairly advanced. The electricity market and gas, natural gas market laws, which <coughs> entered into force 2000 and, uh, in 2001, constitute an important step for aki alignment and establishing the necessary legal framework. Privatization in the electric sector is continuing full force, and there is a rapid transformation in this market. Turkey has completed legislative efforts to promote energy efficiency and renewable energy sources, and the two laws that have been enacted in these fields are an important step in establishing a legal basis. In the nuclear field, Turkey is continuing its efforts to legislative alignment. The legal basis for the construction and operation of nuclear power plants has been established and Turkey is a member of the International Convention on Nuclear Safety. We are also taking steps to sign international agreements and conventions in nuclear energy to which the EU is a party, including the Joint Convention on the Safety of Spent Fuel Management and on the Safety of Radioactive Waste Management. Our main aim is the opening of the energy chapter to negotiations. Increased cooperation as a result of the opening of the energy chapter will contribute positively to EU-Turkey relations in general. And it will facilitate the eventual integration of EU and Turkey energy markets. Such integration is expected to create, create important business opportunities for both sides. Turkey is not a major energy producer and has similar security of supply issues as the EU, given its dependency <coughs> on energy and natural gas imports. It is our priority to satisfy our increasing energy and natural gas demand through diversification of sources, thereby decreasing dependency on a single source. On the other hand, Turkey has a unique geographical position and is poised to become an energy hub and a crucial transit country. 
Turkey is a bridge between major supplier countries and Europe's consumer countries. The Southern Gas Corridor was conceived to transport natural gas from Caspian and Middle Eastern sources to European markets. Nabucco, the main pipeline project of the Southern Gas Corridor, was first proposed in 2002 as aiming to transporting gas from Caspian sources through Turkey, Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary to Austria. Another component of Southern Gas Corridor is the Turkish Greek Gas Interconnector, which has become operational in 2007. The connection of this line to Italy will be completed in 2017. There is also the Trans-Adriatic Pipeline project, which will start in Greece, cross Albania and the Adriatic Sea, and come ashore in southern Italy, allowing gas to flow directly from Caspian region to European markets. The, dispute, the disputes between Russia and Ukraine in 2006 and 2009 regarding natural gas, which have had serious impacts on, the, uh, on some of the EU member states as Ukraine cut the gas supplies, have confirmed once more the importance of realizing Southern Gas Corridor. The Arab Gas Pipeline, bringing gas from Syria to Turkey and Turkey-Iraq Pipeline projects, once operational, will also contribute to diversification of sources. These projects will need to be commercially viable so that they can attract funding. In other words, supply needs to be secured in order for these projects to be realized. Turkey and Azerbaijan have reached an agreement concerning the sale and purchase of 6 BCM and the transit through Turkey of 10 BCM of Shahdeniz phase 2 natural gas. The Shahdeniz gas field in the Azerbaijani part of the Caspian Sea will enter its second phase of production in 2017. An intergovernmental agreement between Turkey and Azerbaijan, as well as numerous contracts between Botash, that's Turkish Petroleum Pipeline Corporation, and the Shahdeniz Consortium were signed last year. Turkey has positively contributed to the final investment decision regarding the Shahdeniz Phase 2 project. Through the agreements, Azerbaijan has gained the right to transit 10 billion cubic meters of gas through Turkey's national gas network and the opportunity to start negotiations on the possible construction of a new pipeline through Turkey. Following the agreement between Turkey and Azerbaijan, the Trans-Anatolian Natural Gas Pipeline project, which is called TANAP, was announced. Construction work uh, for TANAP is planned for 2013 and 2017. With the, real with the realization of TANAP, Nabucco project has been redefined as Nabucco West, a short version of the existing project. Nabucco West could envisage the construction of the pipeline from the Turkish-Bulgarian border to the Austria, inheriting all the previously established intergovernmental agreements, project support agreements, and the European legal regime. In case alternative projects fail to guarantee supply, gas from source countries can nevertheless be supplied to Europe via TANA proposal. EU will have the opportunity of purchasing gas at Greek or Bulgarian borders, whereby dependence on Russian gas is decreased, diversity is increased, and the security of supply of both Turkey and the EU is enhanced. Turkey supports all southern gas corridor projects passing through Turkish territory, including Nabucco. The EU also needs to be decisive if the southern gas corridor is to become a reality. There are issues related to securing supply, technical and possibly financial difficulties. But on the other hand, if different national interests of EU member states do not always seem to converge into a single European level policy making. As regards electricity interconnections, interconnection is a priority of Turkey and concentrate, uh, concrete progress has been achieved recently, where parallel trial interconnection started successfully. 
Currently, technical studies are continuing through various projects, some of them within the framework of EU-Turkey financial cooperation. Ladies and gentlemen, after this uh, introduction to EU-Turkey energy relations, I will now concentrate on decarbonization issues. In the framework of accession negotiations, Turkey is required to assume the obligations of membership, including transposition of the EU acquis and adherence to the European Union's core values and priorities. In this respect, the EU's move to decarbonize the economy is expected to have a profound impact on Turkey's internal policy-making process. As a candidate country, Turkey uh, shall strive to align its model of economic development with that of the EU, while taking into account our specific national circumstances. It's a matter of fact that Turkey's basic indicators, such as GDP per capita, energy use per capita, average population growth, greenhouse gas emissions per capita, place it in a situation different from most of the EU countries. On the road to EU membership, Turkey will eventually need to adapt EU's model of decarbonization to its own economic development path. This would in turn boost Turkey's global competitiveness, we believe, and reconcile the growing energy demand with environmental concerns. Turkey is an Annex 1 party to the UNFCCC, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, since 2004, and a party to the Kyoto Protocol since 2009. But, but since Turkey was not a member of the U, UNFCCC at the time of the protocol was adopted, it was not included in the Annex B of the protocol which defined quantified emissions limitations or reduction commitments for Annex 1 parties. Therefore, Turkey doesn't have a quantified emissions limitation or reduction commitment under the Kyoto Protocol. In the absence of such a commitment, Turkey cannot make use of flexibility mechanisms, that is emissions trading, joint implementation, clean development mechanisms, devised under the Kyoto Protocol to help Annex B parties reach their emission reduction targets. However, a voluntary carbon market is functioning in, in Turkey, where private sector and non-profit private organizations implement projects to limit their greenhouse gas emissions without a legal obligation. A registry was set up in 2011 by the Ministry of Environment and Organization to keep track of the projects that are carried out in the framework of the voluntary carbon market. However, compared to the emissions trading under Kyoto Protocol, the market volume of voluntary carbon trading is quite limited. The energy sector produces the lion's share of man-made greenhouse gas emissions. Therefore, reducing greenhouse gas emissions in EU by 2050 by over 80% will put particular pressure on energy systems. In the Energy Roadmap 2050 published last year, the European Commission explores the challenges posed by delivering the EU's decarbonization objective while at the same time ensuring security of energy supply and competitiveness. According to the Roadmap, Transforming the European energy system is imperative for reasons of climate, security, and the economy. Decisions being taken today are already shaping the energy system of 2050. The roadmap defines various scenarios for achieving decarbonization of the energy system. The roadmap doesn't replace national, regional, and local efforts to modernize energy supply, but seeks to develop develop a long-term European technology neutral framework in which these policies will be more effective. It argues that a European approach to the energy challenge will increase security and solidarity and lower costs compared to parallel nation, national schemes by providing a wider and flexible market for new products and services. The Energy Roadmap 2050 shows that Decarbonization is feasible 
However, to achieve the new energy system, certain conditions have to be met, including the transformation to a more energy efficient system and development of renewable energy sources. We are following these developments very closely. There are serious uh, and various strategy documents that put a special emphasis on sustainable supply of energy. The electricity, electricity market and security of supply strategy paper establishes resource utilization targets according to which Turkey will generate a minimum 30% of the electricity from renewable sources by 2023. It is for the first time Turkey has set a specific target on the utilization of renewable energy resources. The share of electricity generated by gas, an important resource, is also planned to be reduced to 30% in 2023. We aim at increasing the use of indigenous lignite resources and at the same time employing clean coal technologies which will allow for reducing the effects on the environment. We also have prepared an energy efficiency strategy paper aiming at defining a set of policies, necessary actions, institutions responsible for carrying out these actions in accordance with result-oriented and concrete targets. We aim to decrease energy consumption per capita that's energy, uh, energy in intensity by 20% until 2023 through actions defined in the document. Strategic goals of the document include reducing energy intensity and energy losses in industry and services sectors, decreasing energy demand and carbon emissions of buildings and increasing the number of environment-friendly environment sustainable buildings using renewable energy sources, realizing market transformation of energy efficient products, increasing efficiency in electricity generation, transmission and distribution, minimizing energy losses and polluting emissions, decreasing unit fossil fuel consumption of motor vehicles, increasing the share of public transport in roads, sea and railways, and preventing wasteful consumption of fuel efficient use of energy in the public sector, strengthening of institutional structures, capacities and cooperation, employing advanced technologies and increasing awareness raising activities, creating, creating other financing sources than public sources. The National Climate Change Strategy 2010-2020 sets a goal of contributing to the global efforts against climate change within Turkey's own capabilities and in line with the basic principles of the UNFCCC common but differentiated responsibilities and presents its national mitigation, adaptation, finance and technology policies. The strategy document identifies short, medium and long term targets for sectors including energy sector for climate change, mitigation and adaptation. Some of the targets include energy intensi intensity shall be decreased with ref reference to 2004 levels by 2020. If improvements shall be ensured in energy consumption at existing public buildings and facilities. The share of renewable energy in total electricity generation shall be increased up to 30% by 2023. In this framework, Turkey's technical and economic hydro potential will be fully utilized. Wind electricity generation capacity will be raised and geothermal electricity generation capacity will be increased. Electricity generation from solar energy will be supported. Greenhouse gas emissions from electricity generation are estimated to be 7% less than what they would have been in the reference scenario by 2020. National Climate Change Action Plan has been prepared to implement the National Climate Change Strategy. In the action plan, measures 
to mitigate climate change regarding energy, buildings, transport, industry, waste, agriculture, land use, and forestry are established. Selected goals are as follows. 10% reduction of primary energy intensity, intensity by 2015 in the scope of ongoing projects and the planned activities with regard to the level in 2008. 100% increase in the amount of incentives given to the energy efficiency implementations. Reduction of electricity transmission loss to 8% by 2023. Limitation of greenhouse house gases emitted by the industry as a consequence of energy use including the share of electricity. Reduction of annual energy consumption of public buildings and facilities to 10% by 2015 and 20% by 2023. Supplying at least 20% of annual energy demand of new buildings from renewable energy sources as of 2017. <coughs> as Turkey's policies for decarbonization merge in the long run with European policies and global energy markets become more in the interdependent, not only will this contribute to sustainable development, new opportunities will also be generated. Turkey could become a major exporter of green electricity to Europe, once electricity interconnections are fully in place. Necessary investments, in particular investments in new energy technologies, new and low carbon in energy infrastructure and smart networks could provide a boost for economic growth and creation of new markets. It should be noted that nuclear energy is a key source of low carbon electricity generation and Turkey has decided to develop nuclear capacity. Large investments are planned in this area as well. Risks, however, should not be discounted either. There is a potential for trade-off between decarbonization of the energy sector and competitiveness of the sector. We believe that Turkey's role as a major energy partner of the EU will not diminish changing priorities and developments with respect to decarbonization will only transform this relationship. Cooperation between the EU and Turkey regarding traditional primary sources will be replaced by other opportunities. Turkey's ambition to distinguish itself as reliable transit country and energy hub for gas will be realized since the European Union demand for gas can be expected to continue to rise to exist in the foreseeable future. There are however many different forces at play and is not easy to predict accurately long-term future demand. In, conclu in conclusion, I would like to stress that uh, in order to use energy sources in and around Europe efficiently and effectively, Turkey and EU should and would cooperate more closely in every field of energy and technology. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. Um, actually, when, when, when listening, there are, the countries are very different, but some of the challenges are pretty similar. And that, uh, as you described, the Turkey at the moment, I guess the, the, the major importance in the energy sector is as a transit country gas pipelines existing being planned being built um, but then there's this challenge of decarbonization which you touched upon at the end potentially green electricity exports from turkey um, and turkey I, I think itself struggling to develop its own decarbonization agenda um, if i'm have missed anything, then uh, I think Turkey has also still not made a pledge under the UNFCCC for, uh, for, for action towards 2020 as other countries. So I guess what you presented here is part of the whole process of going through this and, and, uh, and, and making that kind of planning that has to underpin any such pledge. So very interesting to see um, these differences and also similarities in the challenges. So with that, uh, <coughs> 
I would like to open the floor for questions from the audience to the two speakers. Um, please, who wants to make a start? Shall we pass that on? It's there in the middle. Perhaps if you a couple of questions. Question for, for Luke. Um, Luke, you mentioned Dieter Helm. Do you agree with his reference um, that government investment in new types of renewable energy, such as tidal stream power, should receive focus? Um, well, is it perhaps we let's let's see whether we collect a couple of questions. That that was your question. Or? Okay, that's the question. Yeah. Um, anyone else at this point? Claire. Yeah. Hi. Um, I have a question both from the Norwegian perspective and the Turkish perspective. Um, first, on Norway, it's very interesting this paradoxical uh, situation where Norway wishes to have an environmental focus and yet is a petroleum exporter. So I'm wondering how radical are the environmental decarbonisation discussions in Norway? And is there at all a sense that we should, or even a suggestion of abandoning for example, the fossil fuel industry, just however much that's possible. And then for Turkey, I was um, uh, interested in learning more about your vision for Turkey as a transit country, um, especially since the Nabucco pipeline seems less and less likely to be built and is quite controversial at now. Um, and even if, for example, South Stream is built, that will bypass Turkey, it won't go through the Turkish territory. So I'm wondering, do you see more of a role for Turkey in future <coughs> under, for example, projects like Desert Tech, where you can transit solar power from the Middle East or even export your own solar energy, instead of uh, looking at it from the gas sector perspective? Thank you. We could take a third one. Kevin. Yeah. I just wonder whether it's opportune in this round to address the Arctic and the future uh, <laughs> Arctic. <laughs> okay, then we can perhaps uh, return to the speakers with that uh, light perhaps. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you for, for uh, for, for the questions. Um, first, on on uh, on Dieter Hems book, it's a book. Uh, I think it came out in September. Uh, uh, called the Carbon Crunch, uh, and I've been reading through it rather uh, rapidly. To, and and I, but it's, I think it's uh, there are a lot of, of issues to discuss in that book. is extremely critical of of what has been done until now in terms of addressing climate change, and it has a particular. Uh, House criticism about uh, aspects of the European Union policy, so it, it's definitely relevant mm -hmm. to to the topics we just discuss here. On the uh, on particular technologies for the future, I'm I'm not really qualified to to answer in detail. I think his one of his main points is 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 a warning against uh, uh, or is it is he has strong claims that that current renewable energy technologies are are not promising enough. He's uh, he's uh, address he's an economist. He's addressing the is addressing, addressing the, 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 the large volumes of subsidies that are needed, but is particularly critical of is, uh, is British and it's particularly critical of, of offshore wind power uh, investments in the UK right now, uh, which he thinks uh, are very misguided. And then, but then he he, uh, he advances uh, his, uh, his uh, towards the end of his book, uh, the, so talking about the technologies of the future, and and then he, he is uh, and he is warning against locking in sort of. Uh, current technologies and 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 with subsidies and and uh, and then he says that the the the, few, the you will need to go to look into into the new technologies that are coming is is uh, is uh, is uh, advocating uh, sort of uh, focusing on or research addressing research on 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 the on, on how to improve in how to improve battery uh, the whole sort of battery functions but but many of them I think are very long term but I'm, I'm unfortunately I'm I'm not. I'm not able to, to go into and, and make positions on the particular technologies, but I think, I think, and but I, even though I think uh, many of you will be provoked by many, <laughs> many of the, the uh, sort of directions of, of his book, is it's uh, I think it's a valuable contribution, and it, it's going to going to provoke quite a lot of, of debate on the 
on, on where to go in the future in terms of, of, of the issues that we discussed here today. And then about, I think I can, can, I can combine, about, uh, combine a bit the, the response to the two, two other questions because the Arctic is very relevant to, to how far and how, or how short or how far Norwegian uh, sort of decarbonisation engagement is really going. Um, <clears throat> there is a, a, definitely a lively discussion in the environmental <coughs> movement on, on, on abandoning uh, uh, fossil fuels but but it's it's stopping there to a large extent because it's the 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 and um, the for for Norway uh, in in 2011 or 2012 or so probably uh, export revenues 50 uh, percent were from oil and gas 25 uh, percent of GNP it's it's a, it's a very it's a it's a dominating factor in it's not the only as you can imagine 25 percent but still and uh, still it's it's very very important so so I think e even even uh, even a kind of the current sort of red green government that has a majority in parliament, uh, with with some of the part, political parties that have been had very strong climate change uh, sort of propositions, uh, there is no proposal coming out of that government for doing anything about the pace of economic and uh, of oil and gas exploration. There's no limitation. There's, there's it's just a free. It's uh, the the uh, it, it's a consensus. Uh, um, maybe maybe not sort of internally in government decisions, but in, in government discussions. But it's uh, it's uh, it's still the the, the, the government's uh, uh, position that that uh, there should be no that uh, that e e that that climate change as such should not not be a limitation on on how to develop further uh, oil and gas uh, fields in outside outside Norway or, or, or globally. There are limitations uh, for local environmental and fishery and other resources. There's a very, uh, as also sort of also alluded to in the beginning, there is a there's a very sort of responsible uh, development of uh, of oil, <coughs> new oil fields seen from a local local uh, environmental uh, and and, uh, and fishery concerns and, and local population uh, perspective. And and there are some, for instance, some very promising. Uh, oil fields outside Lofoten in, in northern Norway that are still sort of pending because because of local because of concerns with the local environment and so on and so forth. But but there is not the political will to say that climate change is is a concern that uh, uh, that should uh, should make us sort of change the course uh, dramatically. And again, this this refers back to the to the statement I, I referred to by the, by the prime minister. Uh, who's an, an economist again, but, but again, I think it's a it's a very sort of solidly founded Norwegian position uh, in terms of of, of, gain, of having a quite sort of consensual uh, basis is that that uh, we we need a carbon price definitely. Uh, Statoil, the oil company, said that we need a carbon price. We need a carbon price that is becoming higher, and 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 I think if if I think it would also make uh, Norwegian politicians, many of them at least, agree that that. That if we manage to get a carbon price that is so high that uh, that uh, any kind of oil exploration in the Arctic is becoming unprofitable, that that would be fair. That would be good. But it, but you need to you need to to address it from the consumption level, and you need to you need to get the price right. You need to you need to to, to get uh, get uh, get uh, the world economy uh, reflect uh, the burden of climate change in in a way by by increasing the carbon price and, and to have the political will to to uh, to uh, to, um, to to get a, a carbon price that is really reflecting the serious nature of climate change, but then uh, to to go the other way around and to say that that we should have a have a moratorium on on oil and gas uh, development, for instance, in the in the Arctic, is uh, then then uh, if if you propose that, then 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 uh, then the oil companies will say that okay, then we we invest even more in oil science and we do this, and and then you will need to have a comparison of the carbon footprints of different different new uh, oil and gas uh, sort of provinces, whether it's also Brazil and Angola that pre the new and major resources there, whether it's oil sand, whether it's oil, whether it's tight oil, whether it's shale oil, whether it's uh, shale gas. So and, and, and the, the carbon footprint of the different uh, different new oil and gas sources and provinces uh, are is a very complicated issue but still a very relevant issue if you are starting to Argue to it that that you need a moratorium on new oil and gas developments. So so that's uh, but basically the the Norwegian position is that this is to to start 
addressing a particular uh, oil and gas uh, region is is the wrong way to go. But you need to go on. You need to target climate change uh, uh, measures on the on the on the consumption side, and you need to, we need to get up the the price. And, and and again, if there is a consensus for a for a price that 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 is high enough to to make uh, oil and gas developments in certain regions, including the Arctic, un, unprofitable, that that <coughs> that's okay. But but it it will be wrong as the Norwegian position to to use climate change arguments against developing a or an oil and gas region in the Arctic that that may have much less emissions than, for instance, oil sand in Canada. But, but uh, yeah, so that's uh, that's that's part of the debate on more fundamental issues on on on, on how to how to address this paradox. But concerning your question, I am glad that you asked that question. Uh, the answer is very clear from our perspective. Turkey is not an energy-rich country. We don't have energy resources, especially considering oil and gas. But we have a very crucial strategic geographical position. If you think of uh, the geographical position of Turkey, we are in the east of Europe, but we are in the west of Asia, we are in the north of Middle East, and we are in the south of Russia. We don't have energy resources, but we have energy resources around us. What we want to be is, the, is to become a hub for transporting oil and gas through Turkey to Europe. Therefore, uh, you mentioned about Nabucco and the other pipelines. They are not the only pipelines. We are going to build more pipelines. For instance, two pipelines are also underway from Iraq to Turkey. We don't see them alternative to each other. We see them as complementary. If, you, if we are going to be a hub, we have to have more than one or two or three pipelines. <coughs> so we can secure the uh, supply, not only for Turkey, but also for Europe. Therefore, we support all of them, including solar power. We want to sell, we also want to buy if we need and when we need. So they are not uh, an alternative to each other. Mm -hmm. Further questions and follow-up questions, Chairman. Uh, I have a single question for both of the speakers. I would like to learn the Turkey's and Norway's uh, perception towards uh, nuclear energy. I think. Uh, we haven't discussed about this uh, during the presentations, but I think it is an important issue. And I know that both of the countries doesn't have any uh, nuclear power, but Turkey is willing to have four fives in 10 years, but I think Norway doesn't have any intention. So mm -hmm. I would like to know. Anyone else? There in the back. Um, I guess I have a little bit the same single question, but about energy efficiency. Um, in in Norway, there are, there's a lot to be done, I guess, about edu educa educating people because energy or electricity is so cheap and so available and so clean or seen as very clean. Um, so, what are the intentions uh, with that, and if, if, if Norway really wants to become a battery for Europe, then it has to have more electricity available, meaning reducing its own consumption. And uh, for Turkey, uh, what are the, the discussions on energy efficiency? Mm -hmm. especially to the uh, people from Turkey. Um, if you look at Brazil, you can print uh, CO2 certificates if you uh, invest in uh, renewable energy projects. If you look at uh, Russia, India, China, all of them, um, they are under the CDM uh, mechanism. 
still you have opted out of that. I, I, I can't see any explanation uh, or logic for that. Where have the other gone astray then, and where are you then? Because you are, you, you look very business minded. We want to be the hub and and so forth. And this is a, a good mechanism, I think, to attract additional finance. So I don't see why you have completely isolated yourself. Uh, not using that mechanism actually. Ah, yeah. and, and maybe then regarding to the the lecture and from today, do you feel in, in when you are talking to the European Commission for example, do you feel any, any kind of lobbying making your life more difficult in uh, integrating yourselves into the European Commission because you have opted out? Uh, that was also a maybe a relevant question. <coughs> Maybe I can I can add to to the length of your interventions. <laughs> and just um, I, I I was wondering when thinking about about Norway, if you think in a decarbonization agenda, uh, you you mentioned the price and the price can go up 100, 200 euros, and then okay, then then we'll switch. And I guess there are opportunities then for for Norway to go to renewables, as we have heard, and then make business out of that. Um, but it may also be that we decarbonize without 100 or 150 euros uh, of, of a tax. And is, is there any strategic thinking how that, how, what, how that would develop? Uh, because then you may suddenly have an oversupply of, of gas to Europe from Russia, from Norway, and then, then you suddenly compete in that area with, with a remaining demand. So the demand diminishes and, and there's lots of uh, supply. Is, is that not a, a dilemma, that, a further dilemma? And perhaps on Turkey, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what I, um, if I can be provocative. It's a little bit, as, as we've heard, I think during the lecture series, a little bit from, from some uh, quarters of the energy sector in general. There seems to be a recognition of a decarbonization agenda that's out there, and you work on it, and 30% renewables, and uh, yes, we are moving. And then when it comes to the hardware on the ground, it's we're building pipelines and we are the hub for oil and gas. And then you think, we are in 2012, and you have these plans into 2020, etc., and build all this infrastructure, but once you're in 2020, 25, we should be pretty close going down to the decarbonization agenda. So how it doesn't seem to fit. Mm -hmm. So there's talk about decarbonization, and then there seems to be action that's contradicting that, if I can be just proactive. So what's What's the plan? That's <laughs> the question, is it to, to align those goals? May I start? <laughs> <laughs> Since well, I it's not contradictory, <coughs> I, I guess. Not because uh, uh, on the one hand, you have to grow. On the other hand, if you consider in the case of Turkey, we do not have the technology. And the, the latest technology is not very cheap. You have to strike a balance between growing and uh, employing clean technologies. We think you can do both at the same time. You can grow, but you have to compromise. It's going to take time. On the one hand, we are trying to increase efficiency and employ uh, clean technologies. And on the other hand, we have to satisfy the needs of the economy. We are growing about 5% on average every year. We have to find energy, and we don't have the energy. Therefore, uh, uh, the answer is also to the nuclear energy. Therefore, we are building nuclear power. We have decided to build nuclear power plants. We want to diversify. We don't want to depend on one source or two sources, especially imported sources. We have to have our own sources as well, and therefore we are building nuclear power plants. I know that this is a political decision, an important decision. Personally, I wouldn't want to have a nuclear power plant, but when you consider from the economic perspective, you can still build a plant and can be safe and you can have clean energy. And as I say, in Japan as well. We are, we are, well, that's a different case. 
uh, therefore, we are also providing incentives for wind and solar power uh, plants. So uh, it will take time, but it's going to take a long time. Okay, I mean, I just take a response. Okay. <laughs> Did you want to also immediately take, take up some of the other questions? Why? Well, uh, we want to align with EU very quickly, but we don't see the same behavior from the other side. Mm -hmm. So we should go to parallel to each other. If they cooperate, we'll cooperate. If they don't, we'll we'll we may we might go the other way. So if you come uh, forward a step, they should also come forward. We want to say we we always say that we want to adopt EU standards and say. They say, you know, stop the negotiations. So, if I may say so, we are also bargaining. Mm -hmm. So it's a give and take situation. Well, you, you can follow up if you if you wish. Um, okay. Uh, First on nuclear, uh, nuclear is not a proposition in Norway. We have uh, we have almost 100 percent uh, of our electricity from from hydropower, and we can even build more hydropower. And so, so nuclear has really never been an issue in Norway. Uh, I think if you, if you are sort of developing the argument into into, into, the, into the extreme and said that we could say we could have 10 cables, we could have 20, we could have 30 electricity cables from over to Europe, uh, then of course you could. Uh, in theory, argue that that in addition to really developing and, and further developing the the hydropower resources, we could even also build nuclear power in order to export. But but then it's it's it's, it's not a realistic scenario, and, and it's 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 not needed, and, and therefore it has never been a proposition. And I, I think also from a more sort of analytical perspective, I think I, what we see, for instance, in the UK, even if they sustain their policy to continue with nuclear after after Fukushima uh, two years ago, and having climate change as a major uh, driving driver of that uh, policy agenda, they still have problems. It's still an open question whether whether nuclear can be economic in, in in the UK. So 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 I think it, it hangs very much in the in the balance in, in many countries, not only in, in Germany and, and Japan and, and, and Switzerland. So it's it, I'm also very it's going to be very interesting to see see how you uh, how you are going forward with nuclear. I think the Norwegian position official position is not to have a position because it's not we don't want to moralize and and. and so sort of think uh, so. So it's, it's but it's simply simply for the reasons I've stated, not an issue. On if we can change the resources, we might give up nuclear power. Mm. If we could exchange, if we could exchange the resources that you have. <laughs> <laughs> well, quite quite some of the gas that is going go into transit from the Caspian to to uh, to to Europe is owned by Norwegian oil companies, but that's that's another issue. But but anyway, so you will will benefit a bit from the from the gas that is going going from the Caspian to to, to Europe. But but uh, but anyway, uh, on energy efficiency, I think uh, you have a valid point. Uh, I think one of one of the major, uh, I think uh, the important uh, and the, the the positive points about the Euro, Euro, uh, the European Union's achievements in 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 energy and climate change efforts is is the that we, we have a lot to learn from Europe and European countries in energy efficiency. We have had so abundant uh, uh, and cheap and, 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 and environment friendly energy in Norway, so we, we haven't really, so that's why we don't have a very good performance on energy efficiency, so there's a lot to gain. But again, there are some, some, some limitations, and that is, again, uh, I think energy efficiency has quite a lot to do with uh, critical mass. Uh, I mean, the big economies, uh, they, you need an economy of scale in many areas to really advance on energy efficiency. So, so the gains, I think, in, if you compare what the, the, the volumes that Norway can contribute to Europe in terms of clean electricity, uh, I mean, the, the, major, the major potential there is probably to build pump, and pump storage uh, uh, stations where you are, where you are uh, pumping up the water uh, when electricity is is cheap and abundant from Europe, and then you are when when, uh, when the wind is not blowing and the sun is not shining in Europe, you 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 you, uh, you allow the water to fall again and create energy and and, and then uh, export the, the 
the electricity to Europe. So, so the, the size of the, I mean, there is a potential, in, in, and, and we definitely should pursue it. And, and the integration in, in, in the European Union uh, energy uh, business for, for Norway really means that we have incentives and also some, some sticks uh, from the EU to, to really to, to, uh, to become better in, in energy efficiency. But it's not, a big, it's not a big issue on the European level, also because our economy is so small. I think the, where our emissions are difficult to reduce uh, are in the transport sector. That is very good. Norway is uh, as all, partly because of uh, generous sort of oil revenues, we managed to keep, uh, we could have could kept a very, very decentralized uh, population pattern. And, and that means high transport costs and high emissions from transport and socially very, very disruptive uh, proposals to reduce emissions. Because if you are, if you are, going to reduce emissions significantly from the transport sector and no, all, it, it, it has a kind of social profile that is very difficult for the political party or for, for the politicians to pursue. So there are some, some dilemmas there. And then, then the key issue about uh, emissions from, from production of energy, production of oil and gas, then the issue is who should come for that? Is it, is it Norway or is it the, the, the countries that are benefiting from, from, from the gas? So again, there are some, 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 uh, some, some issues there. But then the fundamental issue about the, the um, uh, which is, should really be posed to the, of course, to the companies mm -hmm. and, and, and the longer term strategies, the, the scenario people in the, in, 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 in the industry. Um, I, I think that there, a cynical uh, response would be to just to, to, to get up as much as possible of the oil and gas before, it's, uh, before the price is going down. So, because that is, that is one, I think, one pattern of, of thought that is. Probably is there, as in for, for any sort of company that is is uh, is uh, uh, is pursuing it, its own its own its own interest. Uh, but again, one 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 fundamental uh, challenge is uh, I think for the industry is is, is the, the, they have the, the, they have benefited from long term gas agreements with Europe uh, pipelines uh, twenty years uh, twenty years agreements and also linkage of, of of gas prices to oil prices and so on and so forth. That that world is now. Disappearing. So one one response to to a much more uncertain future, including how how whether whether Europe will be will be demanding or, or wanting uh, gas from Norway, is to to just uh, de uh, develop much further the LNG option, so that you can uh, so so that uh, you can ship ship the uh, LNG around the world to, to those who would still be willing to to buy it, and if Europe doesn't want it, so so that is is a uh, and. Uh, just two weeks ago, uh, the the first LNG tanker went from from Norway, Kirkenes in, in northern Norway, to Japan, across the northern sea route. It's the first time that an LNG tanker had, had, has used the, the, the northern sea route, and then escorted by two, uh, two, two Russian nuclear icebreakers. But but again, so uh, not necessarily good news. And again, it's a the deeply the deep paradoxes about the melting Arctic that makes it possible to. To, uh, to increase transport through the Northern Sea route. But I think it's a sign of, of things to come. Mm -hmm. But, but uh, again, uh, there's, uh, there's a lovely uh, discussion again about, uh, about these fundamental dilemmas. But, but again, to, uh, it, it's, it's quite, uh, at, at least for now, there is no political party, at least in position, that has the, has the guts to say that the climate change as such is an argument against developing new oil and gas resources. So, so that's um, I don't know if, 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 if there is anyone in other oil and gas producing countries that are, are doing that. But again, again, I, I think from from a, it's it again as long as you can say that that oil sand and, and also probably tar sands and 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 um, and, um, and pre salt resources outside Brazil and Angola are much more CO two intensive than uh, oil and gas resources in the Arctic, for instance, maybe. But but as, as long as you have these equations. It's it's difficult to sustain arguments, also because this is a very long-term industry. You need if, if you are if you are putting up brakes on on uh, on investments today, it's 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 an industry that needs 20, 25 years. That's that's a dilemma. Uh, again, you are vulnerable and, and you and you need very clear uh, framework uh, conditions in order to develop such an industry. And and that's the, again uh, sort of. Underscores and even even deepens this dilemma about how to how to develop, how to be a be, be a responsible uh, responsible in terms of climate change and still be a fossil fuel 
producer and again CCS. If CCS is not coming, then 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 the the uh, dilemma for Norway is becoming much more acute. Mm -hmm. Thanks. We would have time for for another round if you wish, Claire. And those who are leaving, there will be reception with <laughs> 10 minutes. I'm so sorry to pose another question, but I'm struck by this conversation on infrastructure. Um, because both of you, in both of your pre presentations, said if we want to move to decarbonization and have a role with the EU in a decarbonization scenario, we need infrastructure. Now, you didn't mean gas pipelines and oil pipelines, you meant other things, yet there was no. Uh, explanation of how this infrastructure is going to come about, no uh, even idea where this investment will come from. And doesn't it seem, you don't, doesn't the question come up, so why do we put the investment here instead of here, when everybody says we need this infrastructure, and yes it's a long term industry, so therefore, rather than saying we need the, to keep these current framework conditions, Surely this is the time to change the conditions, if this is the future that we're going to have. Anyone else? You go to have a drink, huh? Good. Yeah, and, uh, drink uh, <laughs> 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 then we'll uh, I, uh, give the floor to whoever wants to go first. Uh, you know, everything has a price. And the most expensive energy is the energy that doesn't exist. So as I said before, you have to, if you have to grow and if you have to find jobs for your people, you, and if you don't have the technology, you have to strike a balance between all those things and the climate change as well. But unfortunately, the countries that have the technology and also uh, the countries that have polluted the world so far, they don't want to pay the price. So if they want uh, the developing countries like Turkey to employ the technology and do uh, uh, not pollute the world uh, like we are doing at the moment, if I may say so, they also have to contribute to the cost. If they don't we have to, as I say again, we have to, we have to compromise between between growth and employing technology and investment. So all those factors affect the decisions of the politicians as well as uh, economists or engineers who decide what to do. That's what I want to say. Thanks. It's a political answer, but we'll. we'll, we'll it will be difficult to keep your developing country aspiration if you are ever to, to join the, the EU. Uh, you can cite the set of people up there, I think, to some extent, at least in the climate change context. Um, right, please. Well, yes, uh, there are many dimensions of, of this infrastructure challenge. and I, uh, But there is one rather sort of hopefully benign one uh, that is very important, and, and that is also short term, and that I think it's extremely important to focus on, and that is. Uh, the need for infrastructure investments if you are going to realize the sort of the green battery function that, that Norway can perform uh, towards Europe and and, and, and that is uh, and, but where, where infrastructure investments are critically necessary uh, but but achievable in a, I think if, if uh, Norway uh, Norway can contribute significant amounts of, of uh, co2 free balancing power for, for wind and, 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 and solar power to, to Europe uh, uh, if uh, in and it can be done in five years from now or in twenty years from now, and and the the difference between five years and twenty years is significant, and uh, and it's 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 uh, it's about political courage, uh, in Norway, in Europe, in in, in Norway the, the the main bottleneck or the the, the 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 problem is that we that our, our our grid is not strong enough, so so if if you if you expand it, there's it's it's already possible to. To, to, to move a lot more hydropower to Europe, uh, but but the, the the grid is not strong enough. So if you start doing exchanging too much, then there there is instability, and then there are problems, and 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 uh, and um, and of course then there are issues about 
the, the, whether the price is increasing. But I think there, there could be a political will in Norway, uh, not only the environmental movement, but also in the political world, to accept the higher electricity price. Uh, in, if, uh, but as, as long if, if the, but, the, uh, but then you have to have energy security, electricity security, and and uh, and then you therefore you need to invest significantly now in in the infrastructure to to make it, to make it possible for for a lot much larger amounts of electricity to, to flow uh, to Europe and, and also of course to, to the, the other way around uh, to to have an exchange. But pr probably if, if Norway really has come to to sort of maximize this battery function, there will be a net export of, 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 of hydropower from Norway to Europe. But then also uh, Germany and UK and other need to develop the, this infrastructure in order for in order to be able to to benefit from this and, and to integrate <coughs> renewable uh, the, the vast amounts of renewable energy into the grids and, and and also to have to 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 make uh, make maximum use of of the beneficial balancing power that hydropower performs. Because if you don't have hydropower, you need to have either gas plants or you need to to balance uh, solar and wind. In, in, in other ways, so I think that this is uh, this is uh, uh, again just the, the building the cables is is uh, under under underwater. Also, we have a lot of competence from the oil and gas industry. It's, it's not the, it's not the biggest obstacle. It takes time and it's, it's billions of euros for each cable probably. But but still, there's so much money to gain from the. It's, it's such a good business proposition uh, that that so so that that is not the biggest bottleneck. The biggest bottleneck is is the the uh, the underinvestment in, 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 in grids, both in Norway and in Europe, for over, over 30 years. It has never been popular just to build new projects, to, to keep up and to strengthen the grid has been under prioritized. That now has to become the key issue. And then, then, you, then you can, uh, it's not a panacea. I mean, the, 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 there are much more also fundamental issues. But I think if you focus on the doable and also in a rather sort of five, 10 years perspective, then to, to get the infrastructure in place, both in Norway and Europe, to, to, to be able to realize this uh, green battery function. That's, that's one of the, I think, one of the areas where Norway can really be relevant to Europe in a, in a climate perspective. Thank you very, very much. I think that brings us to the very end of our lecture series. Um, I, I think that, if I can, can just say that, that, that today's discussion has displayed as many lectures before, but, but I think in an exemplary way, the kind of dilemmas uh, that, that Europe is facing, that the neighboring countries are facing in this decarbonization agenda where the political goal is somehow established. But when you look at what's happening on the ground, then there are all these choices to be made. And there is a lot of talk then about decarbonization. There's a lot of action going on that may not necessarily be complementary and, uh, and, and in line with those decarbonization aspirations and, and goals. Uh, and I think uh, the cases of Norway and, and uh, Turkey today have, have displayed that very, very clearly that, uh, yeah, that there's still a long way to go, to <laughs> put it somehow positively, towards that decarbonization uh, agenda and lots of choices, investments uh, to, to be made. Um, I want to thank the speakers very much. I want to also thank all of you in the audience uh, very much for following some of you, I think, nearly all of the lectures. Uh, thanks very much. Um, please join us for a, a, a drink and a bite um, outside the room there to the, to the right. And perhaps we conclude the lecture series also with a big thank you again to the speakers and a little applause. Thank you very much.